Promise talks about Halloween, Halloween, Halloween. Let's all talk about Halloween, Silver Shamrock. Pet Cemetery Bloodlines from 2023. This just came out on Paramount Plus. Um, all right, so check it out. Much like we talked about No One's Gonna Save You or whatever, I had very, very low expectations for this one. I was kind of rolling my eyes. just like, come on, what is this going to be? Am I going to like it? I didn't realize that this was a, this is not a prequel to the original Pet Cemetery films. We have Pet Cemetery, Pet Cemetery 2, Pet Cemetery 2, and then you have Pet Cemetery, the remake that came out. Um, this is a prequel to that. Okay. So that's like the, it's, it's more in that world than in the original pet cemetery world. Um, here's the thing. I'm kind of weary of prequels in general for a few reasons. Okay. Uh, they typically tell us a story that we already know the conclusion to and give us answers to questions that we never asked nor needed to ask. So that's a thing, you know, it's like, we'd, like we're already seeing the, the questions that a prequel is answering are already being answered in the movie that they're a prequel of, you know what I mean? To an extent, I don't need to know the story. In fact, I don't need this to know the story behind the story. In fact, it's like, it's like, leave it to my imagination. Let it, let it like, just like simmer in my brain. Like a great example is, you know, the thing that I love about the, the, the monologue, the short monologue, the monologue, the speech in, in Blade Runner, one of the greatest considered to be one of the greatest science fiction monologues of all time um, is when uh, Roy Batty played by uh, the brilliant Rudker Howard, he's talking about um, seeing uh, sea beams glittering in the dark or watching the something on fire off the shoulder of Orion. And it like, it's like he 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 talks about these things that we can't possibly imagine off on some distant world, like the things that he has seen, and yet we don't cut to the things that he's seen. We just sort of have to imagine them ourselves, and it makes them so epic and awesome. So it makes by by him telling us about these things that are epic and awesome that we can't see it gives like a real gravitas and impact to what he is saying in that moment to show us it would almost cheapen it. You know what I mean? Um, and additionally, it's like, again, we don't need to know. We don't need to know why sea beams are glittering off a of Hauser's gate or whatever. No, is it sea beams glittering off of the shoulder of Orion and something at Hauser's gate. I don't remember. It, beautiful language, beautiful, beautiful soliloquy like language. And we just don't need to see it. I don't need a whole movie as, as cool as it would be. I don't need a movie of Roy Batty, you know, by Hauser's gate. I don't need it. All I needed is him talking about it in that, in that monologue. Um, on the flip side, Quint doing his monologue in, the Indianapolis speech in Jaws, which is considered, again, much like the Blade Runner thing we were just talking about. This, the Indianapolis speech is one of the greatest monologues ever written in the history of cinema. It is, it's a legendary thing all of its own. We could do a whole podcast about it. I'm not going to podcast about it right now. We've talked a little bit about it in the past. But the story that he tells is essentially this contained sort of thing that could work as its own movie. It's far enough removed. Here's the thing, like, like backstories like that are, are told to us because they inform the choices that the characters are making, you know, in, in the present, in the moment of the story that you're in. However, sometimes the stories are so fascinating, so harrowing, so impactful that you could, you could tell a contained sort of spinoff about said thing. So the idea of Quint starring in an Indianapolis movie, which they tried to make for years and never successfully did, I think would actually kind of work. Would I, do I need it? No, not at all. But if they made it, would it be, would it pique my curiosity? Would I want to check it out? Yes, I think I would. 
And uh, that really brings us to what I want to say about Pet Cemetery Bloodlines, which is entirely based on a, a single chapter from the book, Pet Cemetery. And it's mentioned in the movie. We see a whole flashback of this when, um, uh, what's his face? Uh, played by playing Judd. Um, John Lithgow is telling us what happened uh, all those years ago. And now they've fleshed out. They've really, really fleshed it out. They they did a they sort of updated things. It takes place during uh, via, in 1969 uh, with a Vietnam vet, and it's it's actually pretty interesting. And I found myself quite surprised. Uh, it ended up hooking me in, um, even though we've seen some of this story in the remake that it's connected to. Uh, it, it flushes it out in in this really great self contained story. And it comes to its natural conclusion. The natural conclusion is that Judd moves moves into that house. And we now know why he moves into that house at, next door to where eventually uh, the whatchamacallits will move in and uh, where, where Gage, Gage's family will move in and, you know, sort of informs, you know, his purpose there. But it doesn't really line up. And that's the other problem with prequels is sometimes they they in an effort to flesh out everything that's happening and make it into its something bigger than it was in the original, it then doesn't quite fit the er, the sort of story agency in the movie it is trying to service. So, for instance, John Lithgow tells the father, I forget his name, that he can resurrect his child, you know, at the pet cemetery. Basically, tells him that he could do this. You know, this story. The 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 Judd in Pet Cemetery Bloodlines would never do that. The Judd in Pet Cemetery Bloodlines would not ever, no matter the situation, because they know, especially after everything that they went through and all the death that they witnessed, would never allow that. So it, it again, it kind of contradicts itself as a, as a as a point. In fact, when I think about that out loud, and I'm saying it, I'm actually editing my. Okay, this movie is. I'm taking this down to three stars. This is three. I'm giving it three out of five stars instead of three and a half, because I really do think that really does um, sort of hurt the story. Great, it hurts the story a lot. Um, one thing that was really interesting about the story that I was not expecting that it did a great job with, you know, horror and science fiction are are great vehicles for exploring all sorts of social issues. Uh, you know, in addition to, you know, just humanity, right? Um, this film does a great job of exploring allegories of post-traumatic stress disorder as a result of going to the Vietnam War, you know, being shell-shocked, that sort of thing, as well as mental illness and dealing with family members who enable such illness to continue unchecked. Because a lot of time, a lot of times when someone who is mentally ill and off their medication that maybe allows them to function or keeps them from having their brain rot and melt, you know, cause that's what happens to some people with, you know, mental uh, illness, their brain is literally decaying. They don't sleep at night. You know, if they have like schizo affective disorder, like, I mean, it, it's bad, man. It could be really freaking bad. And you know, what ends up happening is sometimes those people with mental illness, they don't want to get help for themselves. They don't want it because they don't like the way the medication makes them feel. It, they put on weight. They feel like a zombie. There's like a lot of reasons. It's very complicated, very nuanced, very, you know, difficult, problematic, you know, situation. It's like on one hand, I don't want to be a zombie. I don't want to gain weight. I don't want to feel like dead inside. On the other hand, my, I literally can't take care of myself and I might be a danger to myself to, uh, or to other people. I could harm myself. I could harm other people. You know, it's just, it's, it's complicated. So it was very interesting to see David Duchovny protecting his, you know, his son, Timmy, who comes back from the Vietnam war and, you know, um, unalives himself and is brought back, you know, all the motivations are there. It totally works. That's the, sort of the setup of the story. And then he's protecting his son. He's protecting his son who was a danger to everybody around him. And that is what I'm thinking about when I think about that. So it, it you know, that's the allegory that I saw. And, and I just thought it was really, really uh, sort of, it was there. It was there. And it had some, it had a good impact. So 
I, I, I amend my rating of Pet Cemetery Bloodlines to three stars out of five. Absolutely check it out. It Another film that did exceed my expectations for it. And um, like I said, I don't know if it really needs to exist. Am I glad I saw it? Yeah, because, I, you know, I like Stephen King and I, I like the Pet Cemetery. I like Pet Cemetery, And, you know, if we're not going to get, if we didn't get a prequel, we would just get a sequel. And, you know, a sequel can be, sequels have their own problems in the same way that se prequels have their own problems. So I don't know, Th this, that, or the other.